Psalm chapter 30. <clears throat> We're talking about pillars of the Christian life. Pillars of the Christian life. And this week, what I wanted to deal with was that of prayer. Um, I think if we were all honest with ourselves, we are all lacking in the area of prayer. Especially given the exhortation from the Bible which says, pray without ceasing. Well, what does that even mean, to pray without ceasing? It's, it's, it's endless. It does not cease. It continues on and on and on and on and on. <clears throat> prayer simply means to ask. It means to commune. It means to communicate with the Lord. Uh, a common phrase in older English is, is, I pray thee, I pray thee, I ask thee. People use that all the time uh, years ago. It simply is seeking out to God in communication. It's us pointing our words toward Him and asking for something in return. Um, the Bible has many passages that deal with prayer in a specific. One would be the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus says these words, When ye pray, be not as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the streets and all the corners, that they may be seen of men. I paraphrase that a little bit. But of course, what it's pointing out there is two things. First, that prayer isn't something that needs to be public. You shouldn't be as the hypocrites that like to make long prayers. It talks about them being in the corners of the streets and, and praying so that men would see them praying. Now, there's nothing wrong with what I did just now, a short, quick prayer to ask God to bless this service. Um, but when we're making long prayers, we're doing it with the motive that people would say, wow, look how spiritual that is. That's pharisaical behavior. Right. That's not right. But rather, we're to pray most of the time in private. The other thing that you see from that portion, it says, I don't know if you caught it, but it says, when ye pray. So prayer isn't something that it's an if or a maybe or a perhaps you will. It says absolutely when ye pray. And that's the charge of two Christians is that they ought to pray always. Before reading the Bible, quite often I'll say a simple prayer, you know, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things from thy law. When I pray that meaningfully and from the heart, I find more often the Bible really opens itself up to me and God gives me exactly what I ask for. My point here is that prayer is something that we neglect. Prayer is something that we don't often do like we ought to, and yet I think we should. So there, like I said, there's all sorts of passages I could turn to that show you great men of God praying unto the Lord and receiving things for it. Great examples of prayer, great exhortations to prayer. But one thing I wanted to turn to in particular was Psalm chapter 30 that jumped out at me and the idea of prayer. And the different ways that someone would pray, I believe, are all contained in this short little psalm here. As we read Psalm chapter 30, notice what the Bible says. I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. Extol. I will extol thee, O Lord. What does that mean? Extol is to simply praise with enthusiasm. It's a very excited, like, praise the Lord. I'm, I'm excited to praise the Lord. I'm excited to lift up my voice unto him. And that's what extol means. It's an enthusiastic, a rejoicing type of a praise that you give unto God. And here he exhorts, or here David extols the Lord because he has lifted him up. And we should get excited about the fact that a lowly person like, like David, who was a shepherd boy, could be lifted up to such a height. And he's excited about the fact that God would deem him worthy to be there. In the same way, a lowly worm like myself, who was, who was a wretch in my life before, who was, who was wicked and always, always doing wrong things, my mind was permanently against the Lord. And now he has me in this position where, hey, I can live and walk and, 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 and be what God wants me to be. I have that power. I have that ability because God has lifted me up from the mess that I was in. My family is there, I believe now, because God has lifted me up. My son Caleb is there because God has lifted me up and esteemed me very high. I will extol him with enthusiasm, praise him. And now we see why sometimes this type of prayer is something that you would do in secret. Because if we see somebody just getting really excited and acting kind of, kind of excitable, sometimes it's a little strange and off-putting. But hey, when I'm alone and nobody else is around, I sometimes get really excited about the Lord and do some you know, crazy fist pumps or jump around or, or dance and sing and all sorts of extolling unto the Lord that maybe I wouldn't be so comfortable doing in public. I am extolling the Lord, as David is here, that he has not made my foes to rejoice over me. 
And there's so many times that I think that I have been exacted less than what I deserve. That people that don't like me should be able to put me down in the dirt and stomp all over me because I have been wrong and I have wronged others. And yet God makes it so that those that are foes of mine don't rejoice over me. Praise be to God that he would do such a thing. I give him all the glory due unto his name. The famous hymn says, give him the glory, great things he hath done. That's not something that we, we sing to the Lord in just kind of a, give him the glory, great things he hath done. You know, the reality is, is that if we're really extolling the Lord in something like that, the great things that he has done, we're going to get a little bit excited. We're going to shout and say, praise the Lord. Oh, God, you've been so good to me. I extol thee, O Lord. That's one way we can pray unto God, to extol him, to lift him up with excitement in our voices. Verse 2 says this, O Lord, my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down into the pit. The next thing we see is that I cried unto the Lord. Another way that we can reach out to God. It's an expressive utterance. I cried. We know that term quite often nowadays in our context is as having tears falling. I think it always has to be that case. But I do believe that there is a certain emotion behind it. Maybe not the excitableness of an extolling of God where you're, where you're shouting and you're overjoyed. Quite often crying unto God comes with an earnestness to it. It comes with a, a need. It comes with a desire. It comes with some Something that is is emotional there's turmoil about look at the example here it says thou hast brought up my soul from the grave right before that it says thou hast healed me well if you needed to be healed you were you were harmed you were hurt in the beginning so there was an emotion there was a pain to the crying that was made unto the Lord and we need to do the same thing cry unto the Lord when we're hurting that we would be healed Cry unto the Lord that our soul would be kept from the grave. That, you know, the situations of life that come upon us that very well could have killed us. When there's something grave and, and severe in our lives that God kept us from it. He kept us alive. And cry unto the Lord. Here's one of the things that I should not go down into the pit. The Bible says that when we cry out to God for salvation, he keeps us from the pit. He keeps us from hell. And that is something that, that somebody as a very new babe in Christ acts their faith upon God with a cry unto him. It should be no different this day. There's an urgency to it. The Bible says, this poor man cried and the Lord heard it and saved him out of all of his troubles. Can you imagine being saved from all of your troubles? And it all started with the poor man crying out to the Lord of his troubles. You need to mean it when you call. You need to mean it when you cry. You also need to believe that he will answer your prayer in the affirmative. That's where faith comes in. We cry unto God with our needs, with our desires, with the things that are hurting us. And we say, God, help me in this situation. And when you mean it, when you believe it, the Bible says that you will receive of it. If it's according to his will. Crying unto the Lord is a great way to reach God in prayer. Sing unto the Lord. Verse 4 says, Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of His. Give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. We're to sing unto God. Well, what is a song? What is singing? We're in Psalm chapter 30. A song is simply a melodic group of words. It's a, it's a melody that you put to words that are upon your heart. Rhythmic words. We have them in our hymnal. We have them within our scriptures in the psalm book. We, we know that Lord commands us to sing unto him a new song. And, and this is another way that you can give praise unto God, or you can give prayer unto God, you can ask God, you can communicate with God, is to sing unto him. The Lord loves to hear his people sing. Amen. He loves when people sing unto him. And it does, it indeed warms even my heart when I find myself singing unto the Lord. One thing that I prayed a long time ago was that the Lord would put in my heart a song. And I found that when I was waking up all the time, I was kind of grumpy, things weren't going right. This was early on in my Christianity, but I noticed all of these older Christians around me, they would, 
they would have this song in their hearts. They would always be humming. They would always be tapping their toes. They would always have this song. And, and I didn't really know where that came from. And so I prayed unto God and said, Lord, put that song in my heart. And wouldn't you know it, the first day that I woke up, after asking a simple request of the Lord, I cried unto Him that I was missing something. He answered with a song. And I woke up and, and was, you know, Jesus loves me even in my heart and in my head as I woke up in the morning. And that's a great blessing. And that's something you should carry with you. The Bible says, Pray without ceasing, and this is one way that you can really just, just, just empower your prayers and give yourself more opportunity to pray unto God. It's not talking about just always being on your knees and just praying unto God or, or doing that sort of um, robotic ritual sometimes people make of it where you're just, Dear Lord, I pray God that you would do this. No, but if you have a song in your heart, if you're constantly singing, Give Him the glory, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and that's just constantly the, the background music of your life, you are praying without ceasing. What a, what a great way to, first of all, remember songs. First of all, remember uh, scripture verses, all sorts of things. But that can actually give you power in prayer throughout your life as you walk. The Bible calls that being filled with the Spirit. If you were to look at Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 18, it says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. But, here's the contrast to being drunk with wine. It says, but... Be ye be filled with the Spirit. It says this then, being filled with the Spirit. Well, what does that mean? It says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So to be filled with the Spirit is hand in hand with speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, constantly having your heart fixed in that method of song, your, your heart constantly in that same rhythm of just being one with God, speaking to God in those same ways as you speak to yourself, and that's being filled with the Spirit. And it is the exact opposite of the drunkenness that wine brings. It says this in verse 20, it says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the next point. If you were to go back to Psalm chapter 30, it says, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. In the same way, when you're filled with the Spirit, you're to give thanks always. You're to give thanks for what? At the remembrance of His holiness. Verse 5 says, for His anger endureth but for a moment. In His favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. God is here giving David the spiritual truth that he penned out in this psalm where you can be thankful that though God has his anger sometimes upon us, his favor is where life is. And so, though weeping may endure for the night, joy cometh in the morning. We're to give thanks for that. When we remember how holy he is, when we remember his mercy, when we remember his favor, when we remember the joy that cometh and is just on the outside of that dark point in your life. See, quite often we sing and we praise and we extol and we cry unto God and we're just living these high times and that is when we want to talk to God. But the reality is, is that we can also be with him in the down times. And, and, and in fact, I think both of those times are when we need to seek God. We need to seek God always. Look at verse 6. It says, And in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. How often when we're being prosperous, when, when things are going well financially, in our relationships, in our, in our daily life, when things are really prosperous and going great, that's when we suddenly feel like we shall not be moved. But those are the times I believe that we should be extolling God the most crying unto Him the most, singing unto Him the most, giving thanks unto Him, just because the reality is, is that when you start to think that you shall never be moved, that's probably about the time you're about to be moved. Whether it's by an attack of the enemy, or it's by the, the providence of God just allowing something into your life where that He could move you in a different direction, or, or from the path that you're currently on. When we wind down in our lives, when the troubles increase, that's the moment when we start to feel like we can't be moved. But these are the times when I believe we need to continue on and in prayer. Verse 7 says, Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face and I was troubled. And that's quite often what happens is when God is ha in, has us in, our fa in favor, 
feel like that mountain won't be moved. And then suddenly we feel like God has hid himself from us, and that's when we feel troubled. And when we're troubled, we need to go back to God, seek him again. Verse 8 says, I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. So this is the next way that we can reach God in prayer. We extol him, we cry unto him, we sing unto him, we give thanks unto him, or we make supplication unto him. The little word there at the beginning is, is supplication, supply. You're asking for God's supply. The Bible says that though we should be thankful for what we have, there is nothing wrong. In fact, it's encouraged to ask for what we don't have. We're thankful that we have all of the great blessings that we have, but there are some things that perhaps we need, some things we see on the horizon, some things that we need God to step in and make available to us. That is making supplication unto him. In James it says, ye have not because ye ask not. And too often we worry about different things that are going on in our lives and we don't have God answering these situations and these prayers and these needs that we have, but we don't go to him and actually ask for him to provide that. Ye have not because ye ask not. That's one way that you don't get your prayers answered is to simply not make them. So we need to get into the practice of constantly seeking God for supplication. You know, the, the, the well of his, of his gifts to us could dry up if we don't continue to make supplication for him. Just think about it. If you had with you the only thing that you last prayed to God for, the only need that you last prayed to God for, if that was in this moment, everything else was stripped away, would any of us be left with anything? No, maybe, maybe there would just be nothing left because we simply don't ask God in supplication for anything. But if we're constantly saying, Lord, would you, would you provide my daily needs, my food? Lord, keep providing for me the house that I live in. Lord, keep filling my, my heart with love for my family. Those things that you need, those things that are needful in your life, make supplication unto God for it. He will supply all your needs. But too often we have not because we ask not. Again, it says in James, it says, ye ask and ye receive not, here's another way, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. So when we ask, we need to be sure that we're asking according to God's will. It's not going to be God's will if I'm like, Lord, I'm making supplication unto thee, I need a new Ferrari in my driveway. It just doesn't make sense to ask God for something like that, because that's not in his will. Me having a Ferrari isn't going to make me a better husband. It's not going to make me a better father. It's not going to make me better at my job. It's probably going to make me puffed up and think I'm really cool, right? That's not something that I need in my life. And so God's not going to make supplication for that. That would be something where I would not receive it because I'm asking a miss. There's something wrong in my head if I think that I really need a Ferrari, right? It just doesn't make sense. Now, if I'm asking for something again, that's only going to please me. It's something that's only going to benefit me, you know? Um, uh, whatever, if it was that Ferrari, if it was the big house, if it was something that was just to please myself in selfishness, God's probably not going to answer those prayers because it just doesn't make sense. You have not because you ask not. You receive not sometimes because you ask amiss. Why? Because that you may consume it on your lust. When we're craving something that comes from a lustful place, don't be surprised when God answers it. And praise the Lord when he doesn't answer. Because like I said, having that Ferrari in my driveway might make me a rotten person. It might make me puffed up and arrogant, all those things. So God is actually helping you when he doesn't give you those things that you ask him missing. But we should praise him for even the things that we don't receive. Because he's obviously got bigger plans, a better idea of what we actually need than we ourselves. Right. But if it's something like your family member being saved, you ask God for that. He's not going to say, oh, you're asking a miss because you want to consume that upon your lust. No, having your family member born again is something that God wants too. So when you go to him in prayer and say, God, would you, would you save my grandmother? Would you save my grandfather? Would you save my father? Would you, would you help me to be a better witness unto you that I would be able to give the gospel more clearly unto them and that I would show your love? God's going to answer those prayers because that's what God wants too. And when we work together with God and we're asking supplication of things that he also knows that we need ourselves, then sometimes even the things that are above and beyond what you would need, right, with food and raiment, God will give you those things too because your bent, your, your desire is more toward pleasing others rather than pleasing yourselves. Like if you're always trying to, trying to help and trying to help and trying to help, someone else is going to come and they're going to help you once in a while. In the same way as with God, if you're always trying to do, some, do unto others, do unto others, do unto others, he's going to turn that around and bless you for that. And he's going to give you above and beyond what you even make supplication for. What profit, verse 9, is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? 
Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? The next two points I see here. We've had extol unto the Lord, cry unto the Lord, sing, give thanks, make supplication unto the Lord. And finally, we have praise him and declare his truth. Praise him. Just give approval. Give admir admiration unto him. Give glory where glory is due. The Bible says that praise is comely. So when God does something great in your life, just say, I, I approve. That's great. Thank you, the Lord. That was, that was a great and wonderful thing you've done for me. I admire that you would do such a thing unto somebody like me. I praise you that you have the power to do those things. Amen. Praise is comely. It's good. It's, 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 it's nice to give praise unto God. Amen. And he, he, he likes it. He rejoices in the praise of his people. The Bible says that God inhabiteth the praise of Israel. So when praise is coming in, that's where God loves to live in. That, that's where God is comfortable. You know how you inhabiteth your house and maybe at home you got a real comfortable chair and you like to kick back and you're just like, I am, I am inhabiting this chair. I'm comfortable in my house right now. That's how God is in prayer. You can think of the most comfortable place where God could reside and that's within the praises of his people. And so we need to praise him more. We need to give praise and glory where it's due and it's due unto him. Declare thy truth. This is the next thing that you do to praise, to pray unto God. You declare his truth. God loves when you remind him of what he has said. How many times do you read about in the Old Testament where, where great prophets stood before God, Moses immediately comes to example, where God was about to wipe out the children of Israel for their wickedness and for all the, the fornication and for the terrible things that they were doing. He was about to wipe them out, and the Lord stand before, or Moses stood before the Lord and said, Lord, remember how you promised that they would inherit a blessing. Remember how you promised that they would inherit the land. Remember how you promised that you would make of them a great nation. Remember how you, and he just reminded him of all the things that God had said in his word. And God, I'm pretty sure, said something along the lines of, well, I'm glad someone was listening. Because the people that are doing all these wicked things, they had long forgotten the word of God. That's why they had turned to their, their wicked ways. They had turned to following after idols and all those things. But a man stood before him and in prayer unto God said, Lord, remember when you said, and then filled in the blanks with scripture. God loves when we pray unto him, reminding him of the truth that he has given unto us. It lets him know that we were listening. It lets him know that we appreciate his word. It lets him know that, that those truths aren't falling upon deaf ears and there's something that we would then live out practically. So here's just some ideas about prayer and what it means to pray unto God. And the whole purpose that we would pray unto God would be that we would be heard. We don't just want to pray and have it hit the roof. And so these last three verses kind of convey that message. It says, Hear, O Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. To the end that my glory would praise thee. The purpose of having God hear your prayers is that he would answer them and the glory that I received from the answered prayer would be then returned unto him in more praise, in more prayer. Amen. It's just this reciprocal relationship. Do you know why God, do you know why we pray unto God that God would hear us? Do you know why God answers the prayers? That we would praise him and pray unto him more and just constantly have this relationship going on. It's weird if there's a one-sided conversation. I mean, sometimes I find myself, I wake up in the morning and I open my Bible and I'm just like, start reading. And then I, I find that it's not, really, it's not really getting a hold of me. I'm not really hearing anything. There, there's something missing. Well, it'd be, it would be kind of like if I was to just walk up to Brother Yuri and then just He's like, what are you doing? What are you? <laughs> I, I didn't say anything to him. I didn't address him. I didn't even say, hello, how are you doing? It's the same way when I go to God and I just open and expect him to talk to me, expect him to speak to me, expect him to tell me something that I need to hear, expect me to help me with some sort of truth. It's a strange relationship that it's just one-sided. Reading the Bible is great, but why not try going to God first and saying, Lord, yesterday was a tough day. You know, I, I, I want this day to be different. I want to live more for Thee. Can you just show me something? I only got 10 minutes to read my Bible. I need something in this 10 minutes that's going to get me through the rest of my day. Please help me, Lord. And then start reading. 
Right? It'd be like if I went to Yuri and I said, you know, Yuri, look, brother, my, my, my car is broken down and, and I need somebody who knows how to change oil and this and that. And I just make this explanation to him. Then he can go, okay, I can see how I can help you now. He, instead the, of the opposite, right, is walk up to him and like, just stand there. It's, it's, it's weird. It doesn't work. It's not, that's not how relationships work. It doesn't work that way anywhere. So why would we think that would work with our father? That's right. The end is that the relationship would continue, and that's the purpose of prayer. It warms up our heart, it alerts God that we're here and ready to hear from him, and now he can start speaking to us. And what do we do as we're reading? Hmm, that, that's strange, Lord. I don't understand that scripture. I, I'm confused by this. Can you help me with that? And as we kind of walk through this relationship with God where he's speaking to us through his word, and I believe this is the only way in 2019 that God's going to speak to us. He's going to give us revelation from the word that he has already written. There's more than enough there to solve all of life's issues and conundrums and problems that we have. But when we go to him and we say, Lord, can you speak to me? He's going to start to use his word to speak directly to you. And that's the right relationship that we want. God, how do I? Oh, there it is. God, what if? There it is. Hey, hey, God, can you help me? Oh, there it is. And more often than not, when I've gone to the Lord with that kind of simple, relational kind of thinking in my mind, God has answered very quickly. And he even did that with this specific song when I was trying to figure out prayer. How, how do I talk about prayer? How do I convey the message of prayer? What would that mean? It was just, it was just reading 29 of Psalms as part of my daily reading, and then something just said, hey, read the next one too, and there I was. And so on Thursday, I had decided where I normally might have waited a little bit while, or it would have been another day, I had already decided basically where the Lord wanted me as far as the passages related to uh, this truth that I was trying to convey. Prayer is one of the pillars of Christian life, and this is just scratching the surface of it. What do we learn here? We need to extol the Lord. We need to cry unto the Lord, sing, give thanks, make supplication, praise Him. We need to declare His truth unto Him. These are just simple ways that you can talk to God. And that's, that's all prayer is. There's, there's nothing complicated. There's nothing ritualistic about it. There's no perfect position you have to make. You don't have to be kneeling, sitting, standing. Why? Because it asks you to pray always. Pray without ceasing. So this is something that you should be able to do ongoing, all day, every day. And I would be the first to admit that this is something that I don't do all day, every day, without ceasing. But I would like to. And so even now, I can ask the Lord, just as I'm about to do in prayer. Lord, Father God.